passage of scripture from the book of Joshua. And I'll invite you to follow along as we read scripture from Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, south and north, and from the great river Euphrates in the east, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. God giving this great boundary, north, south, east, and west. That'll be your territory, he said. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through all the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Bless the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, may the Lord's name be praised. Hallelujah. My message this morning is be strong and courageous and take possession of the promised land. The book of Joshua, it's an exciting book. So much in it that is thrilling to read as God brings about the fulfillment of the promises that he made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Moses. The book is about the nation of Israel going in and taking possession of the promised land, the land that had been promised so long before to Abraham and his descendants, and that promise affirmed to his son Isaac and affirmed to his son Jacob. In the book, we find that Moses, the great leader of Israel, has just died. And a new leader named Joshua has been appointed to lead the nation and to specifically lead them into the land that has been promised to them, the land of Canaan. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, God directs Israel to move forward, move forward and take possession of this land which he had promised to Abraham centuries earlier, that promise was given and repeated and repeated, and I'll just call your attention to it. Beginning in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, we read, The Lord appeared to Abram, and he said, To your offspring I will give this land. And there Abraham built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. This appearance happened while Abraham was in the land. He had called him earlier from the home of his father and Ur of the Chaldees and said, leave your land and go to a place I'll show you. And when he got there, he said, I'm going to give you this land and to your offspring forever. And later God would appear to him again in the second appearance. This one, he says, this happens right after he and Lot separate. And Lot takes 
what he thinks is the best part of the land and he moves south toward the Dead Sea and he takes all of his great herds and flocks and Abraham is left there after his nephew leaves and then God appears to him and he says, arise from the hill where you're standing now and look as far as you can see in every direction. Look north, look south, look east and look west. God said, I'm giving you this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a one-day possession, right? No, a permanent possession. And a few verses later, he says to Abraham, now get moving. Walk through it. Go the length of it. Go the breadth of it. All of it. For I'm going to give it to you. What a promise that Abraham received. And Abraham did. He walked through the land. This promise was repeated and repeated. Um, we read that uh, God repeated the promise, this very same promise that he made to Abraham, he repeated it to Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. Then he repeated it to Jacob in Genesis 28 and to Jacob again in Genesis 35. And then he repeats it to Moses in Exodus 3, Exodus 23, and Numbers 13 and Deuteronomy 1. And God keeps affirming and reaffirming, I'm going to give you this land, I'm going to give you this land. Now let me take a moment to talk about the promised land. What is the promised land? What is Canaan? Some of you are familiar, I was going to ask Lois if she'd like to play for us uh, the song Camping in Canaan Land. Do you know that song, Camping in Canaan Land? It's a very... Uh, popular tune from the 60s and 70s. I'm camping, I'm camping in Canaan's happy land. Well, anyway, what is Canaan? And that song maybe uh, kind of misses the boat on it. Canaan isn't what some refer to as heaven or the eternal kingdom. Canaan, for them and for us, is the place uh, where we can have victory available to every child of God now while we journey through life awaiting the coming kingdom. So Canaan wasn't the permanent home in the sense of this is it. Canaan was the place for them while they wait for the coming kingdom. And so that's the promised land. That's Canaan. God wanted them to go into this land, the land that they were in for hundreds of years, Egypt, was a land that depended on the river, the Nile River. And all of their prosperity came from the Nile River. But God said, I'm going to give you a different land. I'm going to give you this land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. And its land isn't prosperous because of a river. It's prosperous because God blesses it. And instead of looking to the river, they were going to look to their creator. And he promised them, as you come into this land, it will be a wonderful land as long as you look to me. And I'll provide you abundant blessing. But if you turn away, then the sky will become like iron and the ground will too and it won't produce anything. But its blessing was completely in connection and relationship to their creator, their God. This first chapter of Joshua serves as an introduction to the book. And I want you to listen again carefully to the word the Lord spoke to Joshua in these first verses to help us understand what it takes to move from wandering in frustration and defeat in a wilderness to moving into living in victory. And it's all here. This is the call to claim the land. 
After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea to the west. There are three truths about this that enable them to move into victory that are here. There's truths in this passage that enable them and us to move into victory. And I want to share those today. The first is to claim the promise, to claim the promise. Joshua reminded the people that the Lord had already promised to give them the land. God promised to give them the land. He promised the land of Canaan to the children of Israel. Joshua is commanded to lead the people into Canaan to claim the land that they had been promised. The land had been promised through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these promises were affirmed time and time again. The land was theirs. God had made that decision. All they had to do was go in and claim it, to possess it. God said it already belonged to them. You know, today there are many Christians who, like the Israelites in the wilderness, are defeated, struggling with sins, and many really want victory, but have resigned themselves to the fact that they're doomed to continue wandering around in circles of spiritual darkness in a wilderness. But it doesn't have to be that way. Remember what God has promised to all Christians. Paul writes, But thanks be to God, who always leads us into defeat. No, he always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him who brings our victory. Thank you, God. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession. God did not save us to leave us in the wilderness of defeat. Most of the time we're defeated because we choose not to walk in victory. We refuse to walk in victory. And that was true of Israel many times. I believe there is a place of conquest for every child of God if we follow the leadership provided in his book. Well, how can we have the victory? The victory is spelled out in the next verses. The victory is laid out for us. Here in verse 5, God says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. You're going to have victory. No one can stand against you. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. This morning we sang a song, God will never leave us nor forsake us. That's his promise. And so he says, be strong, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I want you to observe in these verses 5 and 6. Joshua is reminded of these precious promises from God. Promises of, notice in verse 5, victory over every enemy. No one will be able to stand against them. God's promising victory. God's presence and power in verse 5. I will be with you. I will never leave you. God's promise to be with him. Where God is his power. God's faithfulness, I'll never forsake you. He's faithful. 
Verse 6, absolute victory because you will lead them to inherit it. God's promise of victory and success. And further in verse 6, God's sworn promise to give them the land. I swore by an upraised hand, by an oath. God swore an oath to Abraham. He cut a covenant with him to give him the land. All of this is laid out here, these promises. What did Joshua have to do to make these things happen? To have these victories. I put in my notes just one thing. To trust God. To believe. To move forward and proceed in trust and faith. God was going to give Israel the victory. Joshua was merely the instrument that God had chosen to use to do it. These things were going to happen. God promised it. For Joshua to be part of it, all he had to do was have faith in God and act accordingly. Have faith in God and act accordingly. I remind you that the same promises that God made to Joshua are in force for you and me. Praise the Lord. You and I can count on the Lord to do everything for us that he promised for Joshua in the New Testament. Joshua's battle was a physical battle. He had to go into the land physically, take steps, walk the land, and drive out the enemy. God was going to do it for him, but he had to walk. He had to move in. He had to obey God and do it God's way. But you know, our enemy is what? Is spiritual, right? So we have to walk in victory too. We have to move forward in the same way that he did. And God promises he will give us victory over all our enemies. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. He promises he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will always be ever present with us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. God says that he has all power and authority. Matthew 28, verse 18. Matthew 28, 20, that he's faithful to the end of time. He still gives complete victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Revelation 21, 4. And he keeps all of his promises. Romans 4, 21. I didn't put all these up here, but these are the, the New Testament promises that correspond with these Old Testament promises. What do you have to do to see these things come to pass in your life? One thing. Trust God and act accordingly. Trust God and act accordingly. Faith will ever stand the test. God will never fail the believer who has their faith in him. How do we trust God and act accordingly? Well, that's spelled out for us in the next verse. I had a be strong and of good courage. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. In Tuesday morning's prayer meeting, uh, Don McDaniels shared this verse, and he read it from the Good News translation. I love that translation for it's written on a, like a fifth or sixth grade level. So it's very simple words, but it's very beautiful too. And I wanted to share that with you. This is from the Good News Today's English version. Just be determined. Be confident. And make sure you obey the whole law that my servant Moses gave you. Do not neglect any part of it, and you will succeed wherever you go. Be sure that the book of law is always read in your worship. Study it day and night, and make sure you obey everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. There's the prescription. <laughs> That's how to be successful. The Lord tells Joshua that if he is 
to be successful and to successfully lead these people uh, to the rest that God promises them in Canaan. He must study, meditate, read the Word of God, and obey the Word of God. Remembering obedience to the Word of God is the essential step for experiencing victory. Victory in Canaan for the nation of Israel and victory in our Canaan conquest. Notice the Lord told Joshua about the word and how this applies to our lives today. God gave Joshua two steps to help carry his faith. Two ways that we walk in faith, in trust and obedience. He said in verse 7, Keep the law. He says, uh, do not turn from it to the right or to the left, and you'll be successful in whatever you do. He was to keep the law. He was to do everything the law said to do, not turning in aside in any direction. And secondly, he was to meditate on the law. In verse 8, he was to have that book always in mind, day and night, having it occupying his mind with the words of God. He was to love it and to let it fill his heart and mind, to ponder it. And Joshua and the people, if they would follow him, likewise, they were given these fantastic promises of success. He would prosper, prospering by honoring the Lord. God's promise to Joshua was that if he lived according his life according to the word of God, he would prosper and be successful in everything he did. God would make him very prosperous and successful. And don't we want that? Last Sunday in Sunday school class, we, we studied Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, Solomon talked about the wisdom that would guard and protect us. It goes along with this so beautifully. I wanted to share it. Proverbs 2. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you search for it as for a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. You see the, the beautiful promises here of God's word as we, as we dig into it, dive into it, mine it out for the treasure that's there. We are imparted wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and the fear of the Lord. And this will be for us the course for victory. Do you see it there? He holds victory in store for them that are upright. And he's a shield, and it talks about this shield was like what the, the soldiers wore to protect them from the enemy. God said his word is that shield for us. And we read about that in Ephesians the armor of God. And he says through this that he guards the course. Our very way of life will be guarded and protected as we make the word our food. Solomon reminds us that it takes effort though. We have to search out those beautiful truths that are there to gain the benefits. The Lord told Joshua that he would be successful if he would Meditate on the word, spend time in it morning and night to read it, to study it day in and day out. If he would obey it, he would be prosperous in all that he did. What a promise. Well, what is the truth for us in this text? I suggest that if you and I want to live in Christian victory, to have a Canaan experience of victory, you and I must develop a love for the word of God a growing love for the word of God. Just as Joshua was commanded to honor the law, we're commanded to honor the book of God. That's why I encourage everyone to be reading the word every day, 
to be reading through the Bible, daily reading it, meditating on it. And if you've been distracted from that, start today. Restart. Jump in and make it your most important habit. If you're not in the Word, then all we can be all but certain that your spiritual life will be weakened and we become ineffective for the kingdom. When the children of Israel would not obey the word, when they weren't paying attention to it, they went from victory to defeat. And that's the same for us. God doesn't want us to be ineffective, weakened and suffer defeat, but he wants us to have victory and that comes through the word. Let's not settle for wandering but instead seek victory and conquest. Well, this call for courage is a call for moving forward. Notice three times God encourages Joshua to be strong and courageous. Uh, one more. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, be strong and very courageous. Be strong and courageous was the call of the Lord. These words carry the idea of standing strong in the face of opposition. Joshua would need great courage in the face of enemies. Joshua had been a, one of the 12 spies that went into the land. He spent 40 days walking through the land, north, south, east, and west, and he saw all of those people that were there with great walled cities great armaments, weaponry. He saw giants. But you know, when he came back to Moses, he and Caleb said, let's go in and take it. Our God is with us. And just like he blew away the Egyptians that were chasing us, he'll blow away the Canaanites. It's ours. The other 10 spies says, we can't do that. There are giants there. They got big walled cities. God said, be strong in the face of opposition. You can do it. <laughs> Joshua would need courage to face the enemies. They're real. But the Lord's victory is promised. God challenged Joshua, be strong and stand. Listen, there's just a great need for the people of the Lord to stand today, to stand for the Lord. It's as great now as it was in the days of Joshua. All around us, Christians are falling by the wayside. We need God's children to be courageous, to stand up, to renew their commitment to the Lord and say, with God's help, I'll stand and not fall all the days of my life. We need followers of Jesus to make their stand for the Lord. And as we do, we can remember the words of Paul. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. As we're serving him, as we're laboring for him, do it faithfully according to his word and we know it's not in vain. We'll have victory the Lord said to Israel, this land is your land. I've promised it to you. Go forward, take possession of it. The New Testament correlation to the book of Joshua about taking possession is what God has promised in your life, in my life, in the life of the church. I've noticed that there are many misunderstandings surrounding the Christian life. One of those is that some people perceive the Christian life to be a life of comfort and ease, and many are striving to make it easier, more acceptable even to the world. But the Christian life is a journey, and we take that journey, we will absolutely face battles to be fought. Like Israel was, so we are engaged in warfare. Ours is with a spiritual enemy, and like Israel that faced powerful enemies, our enemy is far more powerful than any of us in this room today. Our enemy is more powerful than us. But 
as it says in Ephesians, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our own strength is no match for the devil and his forces, but the good news is he's no match for the God we serve. And John tells us this in 1 John 4. He says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That's the promise of God. And we have victory and we overcome because of the one that's in us. While we're engaged in the battle with evil, there is an expectation that we can and will walk in victory if we live faithfully for the Lord. And I believe the one reason we have the book of Joshua is that it represents this important truth. God's promises are sure. Therefore, in the midst of battles that we face and the journey we call this Christian life, there's always hope for victory. There's hope for victory and there's conquest to be made. The Bible tells us that we're the recipients of victory through Jesus Christ. And I love this 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul closes with, thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is the victory. Faith is the source of our victory. Bill, could you, oh, it went now finally after a few clicks. I wanted number 12, there it is. Faith is the victory. Everyone born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Our faith comes from hearing, hearing from the Word of God. The more we take in of the Word of God, the more we feed ourselves on the Word of God, the more faith we have, the stronger our faith, the stronger we are to be able to Resist and overcome the enemy. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. May you hunger for more of the word. May you hunger for it. Let it increasingly fill you and cause your faith to grow, leading to more and more victory over the enemy. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, I want to thank you for the book of Joshua and this introduction. It shows that you, Lord, want to give us, you've promised to give us victory if we will do what you've said. <laughs> Help us, Lord, to feed on your word, to grow deep in it, and to let it guide us into victory after victory. In Jesus' name, amen.